all right. When we, when we left off last week, we, we had just uh, met Jeremy Bentham, uh, who I argue is sort of a pivotal figure in the junctures between law and various of the social sciences and humanities, in part just because he was a polymath, and in part because he, for the first time I know, brought a scientific sensibility to thinking about the purposes of law and the ways in which it ought to be studied and practiced. So I, you know, we've, we've, we've met him and now we've left him. Uh, what I want to do today is explore three of the social sciences one might encounter most frequently in law school curricula. Uh, this obviously is a, is a very brief and sketchy survey of um, these three disciplines, uh, but I'm, I'm going to at least look at them, identify the ways in which their methodology mirror the basic or fundamental methodology that I suggested the social sciences share, and look at just briefly again at some of the strengths and weaknesses of these three dis disciplines uh, and the insights they provide or promise about, about law. So that's today's project. Uh, next week, just to, just to forecast or to think ahead, we'll look at three uh, disciplines within the humanities, or at least two of them within the humanities and one with sort of mixed lineage, um, if you will. And then I'm gonna leave you with uh, a little bit uh, lengthier explanation of the idea of systemic justice or systemic injustice than I gave you by way of uh, introduction last week. Uh, so that's, that's where we're going over today and next Tuesday. So uh, you'll, re you'll recall that Bentham's signature philosophical idea um, is utilitarianism, uh, the notion that anything that produces a greater quotient of good than evil, uh, greater total pleasure than pain, uh, greater total happiness than misery is to be favored as a matter of policy. And uh, that obviously has uh, falls into a philosophical description of relativism or consequential philosophy that is uh, relativistic or consequentialist thinking is to say uh, that you measure whether something's good or bad by its effects, not by its intrinsic qualities. Um, so if you're Immanuel Kant and you believe that things are intrinsically either right or wrong, good or, good, good or evil, you have no interest. Uh, you abhor uh, this sort of relativistic thinking of Bentham that simply adds up all the pluses and subtracts all the minuses and looks to see whether you come out ahead or behind in evaluating right and wrong. But that sort of uh, relativistic philosophy, utilitarian thinking, uh, makes, it, I think, for us a good segue to uh, microeconomics. And which will be the first of the three social sciences. I, I want to at least give you some introduction to today. But this, this actually has the virtue of, I think, being some reinforcement or even repetition of uh, material that you've covered with Professor Kilcommons already. I think he's introduced you to law and economics, which is microeconomic theory applied to law. Uh, that's, that's the name of the movement or the school, if you will, law and economics. Uh, so some of this may refresh you or 
at least uh, sound familiar to you. My microeconomic theory, that is the branch of economics that's concerned with individual action or individual transactions, as opposed to macroeconomics, large trends, economic trends. Microeconomic theory uh, posits as, as its core actor, if you will, um, someone who is rational and ten, seeks to maximize benefit. Benefit being defined however that rational actor's preferences line up. And the, the economist cares not at all what your preferences might be. Some of you might like chocolate ice cream, some might like strawberry ice cream, some might like no ice cream at all, prefer to avoid sweets. The microeconomist doesn't care. What he cares about is saying that if you're a rational actor and your preference is chocolate ice cream, you will maximize your opportunities to get chocolate ice cream. And for the next person whose preference is strawberry, she will maximize her opportunities to obtain and eat strawberry ice cream. She'll do that in rational ways. She's self-interested. The, the rational actor of the microeconomist cares not a hoot about anyone else. Could care less about the chocolate ice cream eater in her pursuit of strawberry ice cream. Now, she doesn't necessarily want to take advantage of the chocolate ice cream eater or manipulate him or, or treat him badly. She just doesn't care about his preferences at all. She pursues her self-interest in rational, maximizing ways. And she is competing, posits the microeconomist, She's competing in a world of scarce resources. That is, there will never be enough strawberry ice cream to satisfy everybody who wants strawberry ice cream. It's just, it's just a premise of the argument um, or the model here. Uh, so to some extent, it becomes a zero-sum game. If she's going to get the marginal added scoop of strawberry ice cream, what that means is that someone else who might also like strawberry ice cream will not get that marginal scoop. Some trade-off, some transaction will have to be made uh, to decide who values the marginal scoop of strawberry ice cream, the last scoop in the tub, who values that most. And to the microeconomist, she who values it most will end up with that last scoop of strawberry ice cream. Okay? So what, what the microeconomist has sketched out here with a rational actor so defined and on the premises posited is simply a model. To the social scientist, this is a model. All right? And we're going to come back several times today, uh, this afternoon, to the idea of a model and how to assess the explanatory power of one model versus another model. But what you have here, I will say, is a fairly simple model. Very few criteria, easily understood, at least in concept. Um, so it's a very simple, straightforward model. And, and it's not necessarily my word, but this sort of rational actor is sometimes labeled the econ. And it's important and honest, as a matter of fact, on the part of the economist, to distinguish the econ, the rational actor of this model, from you, or you, or you, or you, or from any human being. This does not purport to be a human being. It purports to be a model, a stylized model 
of perhaps a human being, but a model that will help us to explain or predict behavior by actual human beings. With me so far? Okay. So again, we don't call this a human being and the economist to his credit doesn't call it a human being. Can call it an econ, can call it a rational actor, but it is a model that is argued to have predictive value in helping us assess what actual human beings will do out in the world and then to design legal rules that achieve the end, presumably, of maximizing the number of rational actors who can maximize benefits. So you hear the echoes of utilitarian thought. Indeed, uh, microeconomists often get very uncomfortable about a linkage to utilitarian philosophy because it is sort of inherently amoral. Carried to its extremes, if you think about the utilitarian's argument, if we had a society full of sadists and there were a hundred sadists who composed the society, the greatest utility would be to allow 51 to murder 49 of them because while there'd be a great deal of pain and displeasure for the 49 who lost their lives, the 51 sadists would be as happy as they could possibly be by you know, carrying out gruesome murders of the others. And that's obviously an extreme um, example, but this idea of simply summing up pleasure and pain, good and evil, um, happiness and misery, uh, really leads the utilitarian into uh, amoral space where, there, where nothing is intrinsically right or wrong. It is simply to be pursued or not pursued depending on, again, the quotient of happiness versus misery. And that idea, which you can understand why the economist would want to shake off or separate himself from, that idea nonetheless continues to haunt the economist because there's no question that much of the microeconomic model of the human being reflects utilitarian thinking or impulses. All right. So, um, this man I think you've already met um, through Professor Kilcommons. This is the man most commonly associated with the emergence of the law and economics movement. Uh, now, of course, no one thinker, no one law professor launches an entire school of thought. Uh, so in some sense, Posner, and that Posner is how his last name is pronounced, uh, is, is just an emblem uh, for a whole you know, range of thinkers um, beginning about with, you know, about the time he began writing in this area, which was the early 1970s. But he's as good an emblem of the movement as, as we can get, because indeed, he's probably its most influential figure. Uh, he's certainly there at the beginning of the law and economics movement. And he comes out of the University of Chicago which itself is identified as the, the nest, the home base, you know, the uh, ground zero of the law and economics movement. Posner's a, a fascinating guy. Um, he's very bright. Um, he sat on the Federal Court of Appeals in Chicago for something like 26 years. A friend of mine who was uh, a fellow judge on the same court at one time quipped, um, 
only half kiddingly, I think, um, that Dick Posner has written more books than I've ever read, um, which is about true. He turns out a, about one book a year, sometimes two in a year. Um, so he's a prolific uh, scholar in addition to what was full-time work as an appellate judge. Um, and in his signature, you know, earliest and, and seminal work, Economic Analysis of Law, I think 1972, he lays out, you know, his thesis, which is that the basic function of law from an economic perspective is to alter incentives, pure and simple, is to alter incentives so that a free market will operate and those who value the strawberry ice cream or the screwdriver or the Toyota automobile most will end up with the object, the service they value most at the lowest price, therefore maximizing their benefit. And that this is the purpose of law, is to structure incentives so that the market operates with its, as little inefficiency loss, transactional waste as possible, and so that those who value the good or service most end up with it, rather than the good or service ending up in the possession of someone who values it less than someone else. So that's, that's the basic idea. Um, that, that is the basic idea of the law and economics movement. Uh, I will add to that also Posner's argument, fundamentally an historical argument, not an economic one, but his argument that if you look at the common law of English-speaking peoples over time, over hundreds of years, Posner makes the argument that the common law tends toward economic efficiency in a fumbling, case-by-case, case, incremental, often uncertain or nonlinear way, over time, the common law tends toward economic efficiency. And again, e efficiency is what I just described. That is the frictionless working of markets so that the cost to respective bargaining parties of getting to the optimal result, where each walks away with maximal benefit, is as low as it can be. All right? Do you, do you understand the idea of transactional costs? Is that something that, that Kilcommon's got into with you? I'm getting some nods, but a lot of look of uncertainty. You and I, you and I are transactional costs. Lawyers are a transactional cost. Okay, if we're going to do a deal uh, for a, a large piece of commercial land in downtown Dublin that's worth millions of euros, and you know we want to develop uh, a commercial building that'll bring all kinds of income and rents, but we've got to get a willing seller. We've got to negotiate price. We've got to negotiate all kinds of possible eventualities. Uh, what about, you know, if, if we don't get certain government approvals? What about if there's uh, environmental waste issues? Whatever, whatever these might be. Lawyers get involved in both sides of this transaction. And the lawyers get paid by both sides of this transaction to help this deal come together. And that is what is called a transactional cost. That is, you know, the 10 million, do, 10 million euro parcel in the center of Dublin doesn't get sold on a handshake. There's a great deal of cost involved in making that sort of a transaction, that deal come together. And those costs, lawyers among them, regulatory agencies, approvals, permits, 
negotiating with contractors and subcontractors, all of those things are transactional costs, okay? So the argument of the law and eco economic scholar is that over time, the common law finds its way to rules that will re minimize transactional costs or in other words, maximize economic efficiency. Now, to get very far with this, and we won't, again, I'm just trying to give you an, an overview here. We need some introduction to uh, earlier figures. Pareto um, is, is the first of these. I think you've met him too already in, in the jur this jurisprudence course. But he's the Italian economist who really begins the transition of economics from moral or political philosophy to something more mathematic. I mean, he's a, he is himself a pivotal figure in economics. And he, he gives us, he leaves us this idea of Pareto efficiency or Pareto optimality. And the, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to try to go very far into that, but, but the essential idea of Pareto efficiency is that it's the state of being where the last possible voluntary transaction has occurred that will leave no one worse off than he or she was before. So a very simple way of saying this would be Pareto efficiency is when the person who most values that last scoop of strawberry ice cream now has it in her possession. That's optimality to Pareto. Because any further transaction now will leave someone assessing herself as worse off than she was just a moment before. And the next person we need to meet is this long-lived gentleman. Um, he lived to be 104 <laughs> and was active right up until the very end. I mean, active to within months of when he died, working at least part-time uh, through his 103rd year. And I told you that Pareto began the movement of economics away from philosophy and toward mathematical description and implementation. Uh, Coase had something of a bee in his bonnet about that. And he sort of detested mathematical economics. He called it blackboard economics and, uh, you know, tended to be much more accessible in the way he wrote and talked about uh, economic theory than expressing it in equations. But his, uh, his, the idea for which he's remembered and which you'll remember him if you were listening to Shane Kilcommons, uh, is the Coase Theorem. And what the Coase Theorem says is that if we, if we assume transaction costs are zero, they never are, but let's just assume they're zero, okay? No transaction costs at all. Any deal in the world can be done by walking up and shaking your hand, okay? If we were to assume that, what he says is that under those circumstances, legal rules just don't matter. They don't matter because the party who values property most, in fact, will end up with it if transaction costs are zero. They'll simply make a deal. And that is to say that if the legal rules give an entitlement of some kind to person X, but person Y values 
the subject of that entitlement more than X values it. They simply will bargain around the entitlement that X gets under law. Okay? So in other words, if, if, if there were a statute in Ireland that said uh, brown-haired young women shall have the first opportunity to get all strawberry ice cream. And you, as a brown-haired young woman, could claim that entitlement to gorge yourself until you were sick on strawberry ice cream. But you really don't like strawberry ice cream very much, or at all. And the blonde-haired young man next to you is craving strawberry ice cream. You simply will sell him your ice cream, or your right to the ice cream. Give me two euros, Jack, and I'll give you my strawberry ice cream, which I can get by law on demand. Done. Okay? Jack gets the ice cream. The young woman gets two euros. She didn't want the ice cream anyway. It's a nearly costless transaction, and they've bargained around the legal rule. So that, that's the basic idea of the Coase theorem, that if transaction costs were zero, the legal rules just don't matter. Because in the marketplace, people will allocate goods or services according to who values them most, right? But the necessary corollary to the Coase theorem is obvious, because transaction costs never are zero. They're never zero. Notice in my simple example, you know, Jack and the brown-haired woman had to find each other. They had to establish that Jack really wants the strawberry ice cream, and Jack had to cough up two euros. They probably bargained over that, right? How about one euro? Nope. It's got, you know, I mean, so there's, there's if only in the time it takes to do the transaction, there are some costs. Why is time a cost? Because to the economist, cost is simply opportunity cost. That is, the cost of anything to an economist is what you've given up to do that. All right? So the cost of being in this lecture is giving up on being outside on one of the three bright blue days that Ireland gets all year long, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the cost. You could be out throwing a Frisbee, kicking a football, you could, you could be doing something else. That's your cost of sitting in this lecture. If you're doing it anyway, it's because you've decided that the value to you of being in the lecture exceeds the value of the alternate choice you could make in some way. That may be intangible value, it almost certainly is. But to you, you're maximizing benefit by choosing to be here and giving up the opportunity to do something else with your time. So that's cost to the economist. All right? And so the, the corollary is because transaction costs never are zero, therefore legal rules do matter. And we ought to design the legal rules, Coase would argue, to get transaction costs down as close to zero as we can in achieving optimal outcomes in the marketplace. And that's what, that's what COAST is all about. Whatever positive interventions we're talking about making in the marketplace, whatever legal rules we're talking about establishing, whether by legislation, by administrative rulemaking, by judicial decision, these things ought to be calculated, <coughs> designed to reduce transaction costs so far as possible in facilitating the exchange of the tangible and the intangible in, you know, <coughs> hypothetical marketplaces. Now, 
I'm going to hold right there. Let, let me just you, let me say, you, you can see what the power of the law and economics model and thinking may be in helping policymakers or judges come to decisions that are sensible or correct by lights of that model. I, I, at least I hope you can see the value that this brings to thinking about law. I want to just cover some of the weaknesses before we move on, all right? Um, I've spoken of value. Who values the ice cream more? A, a, to my mind at least, a principal problem with law and economics theory is that all value has to be monetizable under this scheme of thinking. We have to be able to turn it into euros or yen or dollars or reals or whatever the currency is, some sort of monetizable currency. There is, if, if, if a value can't be monetized, it's not a value to the economist. So, in other words, the fact that this is one of three bright blue days that 2018 will provide Ireland has no value to the economist, none at all. He doesn't care about a sunset. He doesn't care about a moonrise. He doesn't care about the feeling you get looking up at stars. None of that is monetizable. It can't be bought. It's not subject to a market exchange. It has no value, as the economist defines value. So it has to be monetizable, otherwise it doesn't count, because we're talking about a marketplace, virtual or actual, all the time. You may. <laughs> talking about his mother mm -hmm. and I've seen a kind of in a book review on Amazon and there was a retort to it by the economist saying that his mother got satisfaction from cooking his dinner. She did actually get value from it, but the economist person was ignoring that. Now but you still can't put a value on that, is that what you're talking about? The satisfaction from seeing your son and like that? We're we're talking about roughly the same thing. Um, I suspect that the feminist critique uh, drives at uh, the point that men have participated time immemorial in marketplaces that compensate them monetarily. Women have done work time immemorial in places for which they are not compensated monetarily. And what does money do? Money allows you to go out and exchange things for other goods and services. Money gives you freedom in that sense. The freedom to engage in further exchanges. So when I, when I criticize law and economics for requiring all value to be monetized, I'm, I'm not speaking in derogation of money. I'm simply saying that that's an inadequate suggesting that that may be an inadequate, inadequate definition of all value. There's no question that money has value because it's the common means of exchange and allows you to express choice. It allows you to take value acquired here and turn it into a different form of value by exchange, okay? And that's what women historically have been denied or disproportionately excluded from, okay? Their work wasn't valued in the monetary sense, so they didn't have the liberty of participating in marketplaces the way men did. And indeed, a whole regimen 
of legal rules were established to assure that women could not enter marketplaces. Women were required to bring a dowry to a marriage. Women weren't allowed to sell property without the approval of their husband. Women weren't allowed to inherit money. The inheritance went to the husband, so forth and so on, okay? A whole legal regimen rose up around the idea that women ought to be excluded from the monetary and the choices and freedom in the world that money brings. I mean, just to play out the, the feminist critique. Does that at least partly get at your, at your question? Yeah. So if, if we take it then the next step, that there is no value unless it's monetizable. Now, the next problem we run into, or the, the law and economics theorist runs into, is he literally has nothing to say about differences in allocations of money. That is, it's one thing to talk about the econ as a rational actor who will maximize benefit by seeking things he or she values. But once we realize that it takes money to express value, the economist has nothing to say about the fact that human beings, unlike econs, come into the world and exist at any point in the world with disparities in the money available to them. You may have a thousand euros in your bank account, the next person may have five thousand, the person after that just five euros, and some lucky person might have five million euros in her bank account thanks to the accident of been, being born to wealthy parents, let's say. Okay? And the person with five euros may think that she really, really, really loves strawberry ice cream. That there's not a person on the planet who values strawberry ice cream more than she. But she will be outbid every time by the person with five million euros in his or her bank account. That person, even if they don't particularly like strawberry ice cream, in a two-person marketplace, that person can have all the strawberry ice cream they want if they merely can bid five euros and a dime, five euros and ten cents for the strawberry ice cream because now they have exhausted the five euro actor's ability to participate in the market at all, right? So disparities in allocation of money just simply can't be accounted for by law and economic theory. Not interested in it. Even though it brings home the harsh reality that you value only what you have money to use to bid. Beyond the money you have, you don't value anything to the economist. Fair enough? So, at least for some of us, where that takes us uh, is to a belief, an argument, a recognition that law and economics in and of itself has very little to say about fairness or justice. Has very little to say about distributional fairness. And what it has to say about distributional fairness may be skeptical, may be disapproving of redistributions, in other words, because redistributions are costly in the sense of transaction costs and produce marketplace inefficiencies to the economist. You are moving money to someone who doesn't have it 
and now distorting, so would say the economist, the marketplace, because you're driving up the cost for the person who values the apple, the Toyota, the scoop of ice cream. You're driving the price up for that person because now artificially he encounters a new bidder who's had wealth redistributed to him. And the costs go up. So maximizing benefit becomes more expensive and thus economically inefficient to the hardcore law and economics thinker. Beyond that, on, on questions um, that, that take us away from easy analogies to marketplaces, so on questions of the sovereign's relation to the individual, a man's relation to a woman, the relation of all men to all women, on liberty versus social order, now, the problem with law and economic theory is it becomes very, very abstract. To the extent that it is seeking to create marketplace analogies for some of these broader, complex, relational problems, the model is too simple to be very accurate, or the analogy too attenuated even to be readily understandable. What does it say, what does it mean to say that there's a market for individual liberty versus collective security? How do, how do I express that in marketplace terms? Well, I can do it. I mean, if I'm a microeconomist, I can do it. I can even sound facile doing it. But it, it becomes an abstraction for most of us that's really not a very useful exercise because so abstract. I think another problem with that, that law and economics encounters is that it, it really lacks any normative grounding. It doesn't have a clear set of moral norms or values at the outset. It's simply, well, whatever the rational actor values, that's what he will pursue in the marketplace and the law ought to maximize the economic efficiency of that marketplace. But he may value child pornography. <laughs> Do we want law maximizing the efficiency with which people can obtain, produce and sell child pornography? Most of us would say probably not. No, that's not really what we want, thank you very much. We're not interested in the economic efficiency of pedophiles. Okay, we have other things we value with a small v or a large v, whatever you want to, however you want to distinguish it from the economist's definition of value. And microeconomics really doesn't come in with any a priori set of norms that would guide social behavior. Okay, so. And, and, you know, economists will admit this. Um, and what they will say is, look, you, you, you legislators, you law students, you voters, you tell us what your values are. You tell us what the norms ought to be, and then we'll help design legal rules that will implement those efficiently. You tell us, what are your norms, what are the rules, and will help you then get there efficiently. And then, fair enough. I mean, and, and, there, and there, there is power to law and economic theory in doing exactly that. We simply have to understand that the, the law and economics thinker isn't providing us with these a priori norms that most of us take for granted and think that we need societally. Murder is bad. Child pornography is bad. Uh, you know, um, cheering at a rugby match is good. 
as long as you're not dumping your beer on someone else or, you know, interfering with somebody else's liberty and enjoyment of life. All right, so with that, I'm going to pass on to the next um, of the social sciences that, as I say, most often have an incursion into the law school curriculum. And uh, this is itself a blending of behavioral psychology and economics. And I don't know that you've run into this yet, something called behavioral law and economics. Anybody bumped into that? Is that a familiar term to anybody? Behavioral law and economics? Okay. Uh, it, it, is, it is the behavioral psychologist coming along and saying to the microeconomist, look, there's an awful lot that's attractive about your model, your econ, but he's too simple. The model is too simple to have strong predictive value. It simply doesn't account, your model, Mr. Economist, does not account for enough of known human behavior to have strong predictive value for policymakers. And principally what the behavioral psychologist says is look, the idea of the rational actor is <coughs> mistaken. It's deceptive. Why? Because all human beings have bounded rationality. We have bounded willpower and we have bounded self-interest. We are not purely selfish. We are not creatures of unlimited willpower who simply set our sights on what we value and pursue it single-mindedly. And we are not, in significant ways, we are not rational. We are not rational actors. Every one of us makes decisions, engages in behavior, small and large, for utterly irrational reasons. Why? Because we're human, okay? And, th and this is, this is the, the basic critique of the behavioral psychologist who then seeks to modify and make somewhat more complicated the model of the econ, hoping that by making the model more complicated, she will increase the predictive value, the predictive accuracy of the model. I promised you we would get into some detail about models for the social scientist. And this is a good time to say it. For every, every discipline within the social science, all of them using models of some kind or at some points, the tension is always this. Parsimony, on the one hand, simplicity, cleanness, understandability of the model on the one hand and accuracy of the model or its predictions on the other hand. That's the constant tension in, in any social science. The more complex you make the model, the more likely it will be predictively accurate and therefore useful. But the complexities themselves may trip you up at some point in using the model, in implementing it or thinking about it. The simpler you make the model, the more easily and uniformly you'll be able to use it and apply it, but the less frequently accurate will be the outcomes or the predictions you make with the model. So that's the constant tension. And the behavioral law and economics folks say, well, you know, there's still a gain here by making more complicated, somewhat more complex the model because 
we will have an offsetting gain in its usefulness. So, bounded rationality um, takes us to cognitive biases in the language of behavioral psychology. Um, and I want to just outline some of the common ones. The first one, inertia, which is, which is another basic starting critique of behavioral psychologists about the econ, is look, you're not, you're not taking, you the economist is not taking into account uh, the effect of inertia on real human beings. We don't like change. We don't necessarily want to cross the room to get the strawberry ice cream, even though we would eat it if somebody brought it to us. Okay? We are simply inertial creatures. But the more common cognitive biases um, that you will encounter and you should, you should begin to uh, understand as lawyers, because you will run into these in practice. I mean, you will need to be able to speak intelligently of some of these in practice. Uh, our hindsight bias, a confirmatory bias, anchoring bias, and either familiarity or availability bias. All right, so what do, what do I mean by, by these? Hindsight bias is simply this. Human beings predictably tend to overestimate the probability that something will happen because it did. Does that make any sense? Once, once something's occurred, we tend to overestimate the probability that it would have occurred. Okay? Let me give, um, let me give, try to give you a, a simple example of this. Um, I think you had a, a rare hurricane that hit part of Ireland last fall, didn't you? Sort of dumped a bunch of rain on Dublin and blew hard and, did it hit Limerick? Did you get hit by this? Okay. Um, well, to the extent that the hurricane did real damage, my guess is that lots and lots of people were criticizing the government for not being prepared for hurricanes. You know, why didn't, why didn't you plan for this? You know, look at all the damage this has done, look at the costs that's going to incur. You know, we could, have, we could have avoided these costs at a fraction had you anticipated this. Well, true, right, but, but it's, it's an act of hindsight bias. For the rational lawmaker in advance might have said, look, the chances of a catastrophic hurricane hitting Ireland as opposed to Puerto Rico in the next 20 years are very, very low. So we aren't going to spend a bunch of money to start building houses on stilts in Dublin or, you know, put up seawalls uh, that will accommodate a 12-foot storm surge. Um, we're not going to do that because probably we'd be wasting taxpayer resources in doing that. Then once the hurricane hits, though, now people overestimate the probability and therefore the foreseeability of it. Confirmatory bias, also called tunnel vision, a term you probably have encountered just in everyday life. Once we make a decision, for whatever reasons we make a decision, once you pick the Toyota rather than the Hyundai automobile, once you pick the strawberry ice cream over the chocolate ice cream. We tend then to like the choice we've made. We tend to say that's the best possible choice that could have been made. We confirm what we already have done. 
this sort of bias becomes a real problem in, for example, criminal investigation. If the investigating detective comes to the scene and says, boy, now that I've learned about the victim and I know that she's related to, you know, Jack O'Donnell, I know Jack O'Donnell and Jack O'Donnell is not a good man. I think Jack O'Donnell probably did this. Once that initial idea gets seeded in the detective's mind, the human tendency, the human effect of this cognitive bias is that you start filtering out all information that doesn't confirm your belief that Jack O'Donnell did it. <coughs> so you're overlooking the evidence pointing to the decedent's sister because you're so focused on the idea that Jack O'Donnell is a bad guy and probably did this. This is a very common problem in, I mean, it's, it's a universal problem in criminal investigation because criminal investigators are human beings and we all operate on this sort of confirmation bias. It's, it, you know, we, we can try to train ourselves objectively to avoid it, but it's very difficult. I'll give you a funny example of this, although I won't try to repeat the Irish brogue. Um, I have a very good friend in the States who's a first generation American. Both of his parents immigrated from Ireland to the United States, to Chicago. And his father, who's now 99 years old, has a very thick Irish accent. And truth be known, spent some time in a British prison in his youth because of his involvement with a Republican organization here. Well, his father, who's a real character, who's, 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 who's very funny, you know, delightful man, uh, has lived in the same neighborhood in Chicago now for over 70 years. And there's a pizza place a block away from his dad's house, a place he's been for 70 years. John, my friend's father, will not go for pizza anywhere but the place a block away. And when my friend EJ says, Dad, why don't we go, we're in Chicago, we have the best pizza in the world, why don't we go try another pizza? His dad, in all seriousness, looks at him, and again, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll spare you my incapable Irish accent, all right? But his dad looks at him and says, why in the world would I go for pizza somewhere else when I have the best pizza in the world a block away? He just can't, he can't possibly understand. But dad, that's the only pizza you've ever had. You don't know what pizza is available more than a block away. But it's the best pizza in the world right here a block away. That's confirmatory bias, okay? In a homier context, then criminal investigation is going astray. Anchoring. Anchoring can also be thought of as the primacy effect. That is, we tend to seize first and most heavily on the first impression of something, the first information we have about something. It's hard to shake us off the first information we get about something. That first impression claims primacy in our minds. So if you become a trial lawyer, you need to understand this that when you make an opening statement, an opening argument to a jury, there's a very strong chance you're either winning or losing your case right then and there before the jurors have heard any testimony at all. Why? Because the primacy of hearing the opening statement will have a very strong anchoring effect on their ultimate view of the case. There's a great advantage for this reason to being the party in a lawsuit who gets to speak first. Who's the first to address the jury as a real life manifestation of anchoring or primary, primacy bias. Finally, familiarity or availability also can be thought of as recency. This is why closing arguments, summations, 
Final statements are important in law because it's the most recent thing. It's the last thing the jury will hear before they retire or the judges will hear before they retire to make a decision. Recency also is important to human beings. I don't know about Ireland, but in the United States, as we approach an election day, you get a blitz of television ads, internet ads, for and against candidates. Why? Because political advisors, political consultants understand familiarity and availability bias. If I'm bombarded the day before the election with the name of the candidate and positive information about her, I'm more likely to vote for her. Or negative information about him, I'm more likely to vote against him, vote for someone else. Okay? Uh, a homey <coughs> illustration of this that you, you may get is it's, it's very common, I think, for people to be afraid of being bitten by a shark or crashing in an airplane. These are, these are big fears. People fear flying. People fear going into the ocean because of sharks or because of plane crashes. Why? Because anywhere in the world a shark happens to go out and bite a human being, we tend to read about it all over the globe. I can sit home in Wisconsin and open up the newspaper and I find a story about somebody having been bitten by a shark off Bondi Beach in Australia. Well, for crying out loud, that's a 19-hour plane flight away. It's one shark biting one person, but I'm reading about it. And it suggests to me that oceans are dangerous places, that the shark will bite me if I go in there. Anytime there's a plane crash, certainly with involving multiple fatalities anywhere in the world, you read about it or see it on TV in Limerick. The plane may have gone down in Russia or in Iran, as you know, two recently did, but we, we saw it on TV here, right? Or read about it in the newspaper. And so we fear plane crashes. Now I can tell you statistically, statistically, you are at something like a hundred times greater risk driving to the airport from your house than you are flying on the airplane to whatever your destination is. <coughs> Literally, statistically, it's about a hundred times more likely that you'll have a serious car accident on the motorway than that the plane will go down. But you don't fear driving in the car in the same way. Why? Because you're not as aware of all the car crashes in the world or the carnage of a car crash. You are made aware by images and stories of the carnage of airplane crashes. So we tend to have a bias that emerges from the simple familiarity or availability of the risk. It does depend how you, um, just, I mean, a lot of times when they quote the airplane risk, they quote the risk per miles traveled. Mm -hmm. um, and the risk per journey is close, although it's still more likely to be. Fair enough. You're exactly right. The plane goes 3,000 miles or 1,000 miles. The car ride is seven miles. If we equalize it, it looks different. The basic point is that we tend to overestimate risks that are very familiar to us or available, available to us. We tend to underestimate risks that, about which we have very little information. OK. So. That all behavioral law and economics seeks to do then is to make more realistic and, that, and therefore more complicated the model by incorporating some of what behavioral psychology can tell us about real human beings as opposed to econs. Significant uh, thinkers in this area. Um, he, he probably comes as close to, that's Amos Tversky, probably comes as close to 
an originator of this area of interdisciplinary study with law. He died early. His partner early on, his co-author, is still alive, Daniel Kahneman. Um, Christine Joles at Yale Law School is a significant scholar in specifically in behavioral law and economics. Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, um, significant thinkers in this and also popular. Uh, they co-authored a book called Nudge um, that you know, uh, achieved a great number of sales, became a bestseller. Uh, a, a fellow named Malcolm Gladwell, you may have heard of, writes generally in the area of behavioral psychology, although not so much in its connection with law. So I'm going to give you just a few specific quarrels that behavioral law and economics, behavioral psychology has with microeconomics. Um, I talked to you about cost being considered merely opportunity cost to the economist. Now another way to say that is the economist doesn't think of cost as including sunk costs. Outlays you've already made, they're, they're past and gone. Let me apply it to the model I gave you. I said the, the cost of sitting in here in this lecture is the opportunity you've foregone to be outside on a sunny day. And that's all the cost is to the economist. You would say, well, wait a minute. I've also paid tuition. If I'm a graduate student, at least, I've paid tuition. So I've paid something to be in these classes. Doesn't matter to the economist. Why? Because that's a sunk cost. You wrote that check or your parents wrote that check back in September or in early January, whenever it was. Sunk cost. The money's gone. It no longer matters to the economist in cost as to what you do today, what you do from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 20th of February. And the behavioral psychologist says, wait a minute, no, 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 not so fast. Not so fast. <coughs> Solid psychological research shows us that people, in fact, do care about sunk costs. There's an investment effect, okay? If we put money into something, we tend to value it, whether we'll get that money back or not. It's a form, if you will, of confirmatory bias. I made a decision to put money into this, therefore I must value it. I care about it because I've made an earlier decision to commit to it. So the psychologist says, you know, people actually do care about sunk costs. You can't think of cost just as opportunity cost. You will go astray in designing your legal rules if you don't accommodate the endowment effect or investment effect and bias that people actually have because of the sunk costs they've made. People are not purely self-interested, the psychologist reminds us. People value fairness. It's one of the lovely things about human beings, at least from a humanities perspective, is we care about fairness. We want the world to be fair to one another. At least most of us do, most of the time. We care about that. We even act altruistically at times. We, be, we engage in self-sacrificing behavior. That produces some kind of a psychic return to actual human beings, to do something nice for somebody else, to sacrifice something that we could have so that someone else has a little more than they did. We'll do that for strangers. Doesn't even have to be a loved one. We will behave altruistically for strangers, sometimes. We are also, to flip it around, irrationally cruel, sometimes. We are capable of hurting people just for the sake of hurting them. Even when it costs us money or time or opportunity 
to really stick it to somebody, sometimes we do. Often because we think they've done something unfair that they have some measure of, of cruelty or retribution coming to them for something they've done. We will expend our resources simply to punish other human beings for bad behavior. Irrational, not self-interested. We will act on scruple. We will do something simply because we believe it to be right even if it carries a cost to us or requires us to forego a gain. We might be walking down the street, hypothetically, and see a 10 euro note lying on the sidewalk. Some of us will not bend over and pick it up. Why? Because it's not ours. Somebody might need that 10 euro note and it wasn't mine. Now many of us will pick it up. Finders keepers, losers weepers, right? But interestingly enough about human beings, the larger the amount of money we trip across on the sidewalk, the less likely are we to claim it as our own. Oh, it's a 50 cent piece. Well, I'm certainly gonna pocket that. But if it's a 100 euro note, I might trouble myself to at least ask around in the immediate vicinity, has anybody lost any money? Okay, so we, we, we act on scruple and we act irrationally to an extent. And the psychologist says all of that can be accommodated. The research is strong enough that we can incorporate that into a model and make it a more powerfully predictive model. All right, reasons for concern about even behavioral law and economics in its modification of microeconomic theory. Well, as with economics, fundamentally behavioral law and economic theory asks us to judge it by the accuracy of its predictions, not by the realism of its assumptions. It says, wait, you know, wait, we understand we're still dealing with a hypothetical model of a human being. Don't judge us by that. Judge us by whether we get it right. Whether we, you know, whether our policy recommendations turn out to be warranted or good. Eh, okay, all right, <laughs> you know, but what that leaves me or any of us doing is sort of trusting on blind faith. You know, this sounds like magic, but you're telling me the magic trick is going to turn out right, and I'm supposed to simply suspend disbelief and wait to see if the model works. And that's, that can be a big ask of the public, or of lawyers, or, you know, people who try to think um, intelligently. And what are you going to do for me if it turns out that after I've trusted you, you were wrong and things go askew. What are you going to do? Well, sorry, you know, the behavioral law and economics uh, scholar can offer but an apology at that point. The complexity of the model, I think also we have to, to be thinking about at what point you know, the complexity outweighs the gains in accuracy of the model. And that's just a common problem in all of social science. The model becomes less stable, yes, less usable as it gets more and more complex. And indeed, um, I guess the way I, I like to put this, um, as models become more and more and more complicated, you get to the point where uh, a famous film professor uh, named Patty Wannell, speaking here of semiotics, not of behavioral, behavioral psychology, but, but the point applies uh, to very complex social science models. Wannell said of semiotics, 
it tells us things we already know in a language we will never understand. And that, that in the end, sort of captures the problem with very complex social science models. All right. And the last of the social sciences I want to look at in our brief survey today uh, is political science, which has obvious connections to law. Um, and we'll just go through some of this. Now, you can think of political science as being divided into political philosophy or empirics, okay? Uh, there's sort of two, at least in modern times, two basic groupings of political scientists. I'm not so interested in the political theorists or the political philosophers here in talking about political science, all right? I'm more interested in, in the empiricists. Um, now, th there's obvious connections, as I say, between political science and law, but practically speaking, most political scientists tend to focus on the democratic process and the democratic institutions. What I mean by that is you'll find a, a lot of scholarship on voting patterns, on obstacles to voting, uh, on why certain uh, electorates favor members of one party over members of another political party, uh, why demographically certain age groups or uh, income groups or, or sexes favor you know, one set of political parties or political uh, objectives over another set or one political party's platform over another political party's platform. Uh, or you'll find a lot of scholarship that focuses on how do legislatures actually function. One in the, in the area of law, public choice theory is a very common area of scholarly development and it, ha it has to do with how do legislature, legislators actually function? How do they make decisions? So very, very little of political science focuses on judging or the judicial function. Remarkably little of it. Um, some, but not very much. Really significant uh, political scientists who work <laughs> at the intersection with law um, would include somebody like Mansur Olson here, who, whose work was around uh, collective action, <coughs> problems in collective action, free rider, problems. And is that a familiar term to anybody? Okay, uh, just to illustrate a free rider is someone who, because of the size of a group, can coast along without contributing. So if there's two of us and we want to buy a pizza, we're each going to probably split the cost 50-50, right? If there's a hundred of us and we're going to split a whole bunch of pizzas, any given one of us might be able to avoid reaching into our pocket and ponying up when the bill comes. We might not be noticed. And at just a one hundredth fraction of the cost, we might get away with not providing our share of the costs of the pizza. That's a free rider. And it becomes a significant problem as groups get larger and larger because you can enjoy the benefits of the group activity without contributing to the costs of that activity. That's Mansur Olson. Um, this guy here, Kenneth Arrow, is, is probably the most prominent political scientist uh, the United States produced in the 20th century. He spoke uh, to law. Um, in the legislative area significantly had something called Arrow's Theorem, and I won't, I won't go into it, but it has to do with uh, the impossibility of fairness 
when voters are offered three or more alternatives, that no outcome can be fair under Arrow's impossibility theorem. Um, Ann Osborne Krieger uh, and Gordon Tullock on the far side, both of these are political scientists, again important in the study of law because they've developed the idea of rent seeking which goes along with the behavior of legislators or people who lobby legislatures engage in something called rent seeking, seeking to be compensated in effect for anything they do. And I'll leave it at, at that. Um, that guy down on the bottom is Harold Spaeth, one of the very few political scientists anywhere I know who's made a career out of studying the behavior of judges rather than legislators or voters. Um, so, anyways, that, you know, just, I'm keeping this very general. I just want to get you sort of oriented to <laughs> the places at which social sciences intersect with law significantly. Now, one thing that I think political scientists have going for them in trying to apply social science with fidelity to studying law or anything else is that unlike economists, frankly, and unlike some of behavioral psychology or sociology or criminology, the political science scientist tends to worry about falsifiability. And to the extent that social science rightly claims the word science at all, falsifiability matters. And I don't know if you've bumped into the concept of falsifiability before, but if you haven't, or even if you have, I want to give you a few minutes on it. Karl Popper, who was a philosopher of science, is heavily associated with the idea of falsifiability, but not because he came up with it. This is an old, old idea. And the idea is this. If we, if we speak, speak about the hard sciences, the natural sciences, the natural scientist will accept the premise that nothing in the world is verifiable. Nothing can be asserted as true always and forever from a scientific standpoint. All we can say is that we've seen the same phenomenon under the same conditions over and over and over again. It has not failed. So it hasn't been falsified. The theory of gravity has never been verified. Okay, the theory of gravity cannot be verified. All we can say is that it hasn't yet been falsified. That is, when I let go of this eraser, it probably isn't going to fall up. There again, the theory of gravity, although not verified, has not been falsified. If I were to let go of this eraser the next time and it were to fall to the ceiling and stick there, we would have falsified the theory of gravity unless there was some other explanation. We would no longer be able to say that things always pull to the center of mass. We could say only that they usually do. So the idea of falsifiability is critical to the scientist. He never makes a claim that what he's found is true. But she can make a claim that she has conducted an experiment pursuant to rigorous conditions that are stated and rep replicable by others and that so far the, con the experiment has not falsified the hypothesis. Okay? And 
you can see how this would become a one measure of the reliability of the social sciences is if they're giving us theories or proposals and they can't tell us anything about how we might falsify this, how, how we might test it to see if it holds. That's a significant methodological problem. At least it's one worth considering as a lawmaker or a lawyer or a judge or whomever. Beyond that, in the general realm of falsifiability, can the social scientist tell us what the error rate is? Is there a known error rate on your theory or your method? If not, I have to worry about that. Is, this, is, is the error rate 30%? Well, that's not terribly reliable. I wouldn't necessarily bet my legislative future or bet the finances of the taxpayer on something, on a theory where the error rate might be 30% or is altogether unknown. If you do know the error rate, how many errors are false positives and how many are false negatives? What are, what are those respective rates? How often are you detecting something that isn't there, a false positive? as opposed to failing to, te to detect something that is there, a false negative. Has the work been peer reviewed? Has it stood up to scrutiny by others who are also expert in the field? And if so, where? One of the frequent criticisms of the scientific and social scientific community of law schools is that their publications are run by students. They're not peer reviewed. And so law reviews, law journals tend to be looked down on um, by other disciplines simply because they haven't been subject to review by competing peers in the field. So the, the political scientist, I think, of the, of the three social science disciplines I've surveyed this afternoon, the political scientist probably um, is most likely to be attentive to error rates, falsifiability, you know, those sort of measures of reliability in something that describes itself as a science, peer review. All right. We don't run into much of that, of any of this sort of falsifiability or checks on reliability uh, when we're discussing these disciplines in the law school curriculum. And often law and economics or behavioral law and economics or political science is presented in the law school classroom by somebody just like me who's not an economist, not a psychologist, not a political scientist. And these subjects often are written about by people who are none of the things that they describe in the intersecting discipline. Richard Posner, very smart man, very smart man, but the holder of a law degree, not a degree in economics, and at least an advanced degree in economics. Just, and I, I'm, he's a poor one to pick on because, you know, he has a very sophisticated understanding of microeconomic theory, but I'm using him by way of illustration. So I, you'll find, or you need to be wary at least, that in law school curricula, the social sciences that are presented in interdisciplinary classes often are flattened, simplified, distorted in that sense. And it's a very narrow range. 
you know, I've covered the main ones, the three main ones. We don't see a lot of sociology in law schools. We don't even see criminology, you know, sort of a branch of sociology. You don't see anthropology much in law schools or in law journals. Law and anthropology just isn't a thing um, as a whole. So um, things like the mind sciences, neurobiology, neurochemistry, cognitive psychology, brain mapping, uh, these things are just beginning to make entrance into law school curricula and clinical programs. That's a whole world of actually intersection of natural and social sciences in the mind sciences that just hasn't been part yet of law school curricula as a whole. All right, so that's where I'll leave it today. Next week what we're going to do is start with three disciplines in the humanities, uh, history, philosophy, literature, their intersections with law, and then we're going to close by looking beyond law and society and returning to systemic injustice. See you next week. <laughs>